Okay, this is the East Garden. There's seven or eight gardens on this property, depending on how you count. There's about two and a quarter acres here altogether. And if you're gonna grow anything here, it has to be fenced because of jackrabbits and javelinas, which are wild boars. Okay, this section here, there's roughly four rows. You can see two rows here. You can see two more rows here. This is for quinoa. This is what's going on here. So there's a nice sturdy looking quinoa plant there. If you uh, know lamb's quarters, the weed at all, that might look a lot like that to you because they're related, they're in the same genus. This of course is the one for grain, the gluten-free grain. So there were, notice this one's different. This one's like a purplish color. So in this section here, I planted the quinoa breeders mix from the Wild Garden Seed Company in Philomath, Oregon. They do these breeders mixes where there's a mix of varieties in them. It's not just one variety. It's several to many, including mixes that are as yet unnamed or unselected. So what you can do is grow it out for yourself and see what does best. So that's what I was going to do here. Now these two rows are pretty sparse. You'll notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So yeah, only about a dozen plants. That one's doing rather poorly. This one's doing a little better. There's that one reddish one, and then there are these green ones. So anyway, there were these were full of seedlings at the beginning of the season, and then many of them did not make it. You could tell there was a lot of variation in the mix when they first came up. This is all that made it. So this is a small amount. This is definitely less than 10%. Um, or around 10% of everything that came up that actually then made it this far. So that's um, a pretty harsh first level of selection, but these would hopefully do better. So now over here, we've got another variety of quinoa. This one is from Adaptive Seeds, which is in Sweet Home, Oregon. Notice that this one definitely looks purplish again. This variety did pretty darn well. A, a lot of them came up, a lot of them survived. Unfortunately, a lot of them all came up in the same place, like within one square foot of each other. So then I had to transplant them out. Well, it had already gotten rather hot here when I wanted to transplant them out. So that's why you can see that there's some shade cloth around and there's some wire here that's making hoops. So I used the hoops to make little shade structures over them after they were transplanted. So see, that looks a lot like a hoop house, but with um, with shade cloth. <laughs> so yeah, harsh conditions here in New Mexico. It's already been in the 90s quite a bit. Uh, there hasn't been rain in, I don't know, a couple months, maybe longer. I can't even remember, so that tells you something. There's another kind of quinoa from Adaptive Seeds growing here in the middle. Here you can see for example, this is one plant that has, it's very branchy. Now this is a different species of quinoa. This is not um, Chenopodium quinoa, would be the botanical name. This is Chenopodium formosa. So this is called Taiwanese quinoa. This quinoa got ravaged by insects when it first came up and I wasn't really sure if it was going to make it at all, but some of it did survive, some. And so those are some good genes. There's another one right there, doing pretty well. And then this one single plant right here. This is some quinoa from the bulk bin at a natural food store in Northern California from some locally grown Humboldt County grown quinoa. So this is a single bit of uh, Humboldt, Humboldt genetics here, which you know are quite famous. <laughs> So, looking over this again, you can see there's maybe 20 plants here, maybe a dozen in the first set, so, um, and they're spread apart because I transplanted them to good distances because they were all crowded. So we'll see how they go from here, but this has been um, some hard going 
for the quinoa. Here's another crop from Adaptive. This is purple holus Tibetan barley. I had one handful of seeds that I planted here. It wasn't very much. They made this large patch. But as, I, as you can now see, here was one seed that's now giving us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that eight heads? Nine, maybe even 10. So yeah, quite a few heads on each plant. And then each of those heads has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, maybe two dozen seeds. So you're able to go from one seed to 200. That's a pretty good darn return, isn't it? Yeah. So this was an experiment to see how this how this would do here. I planted it in February when it was still going down into the 30s at night and even the 20s. And it had some trouble with the colder nights in the lower 20s, but managed to get through it. Now it's very hot for it. I hand water it about once a week just with this. You can't tell now because it's buried in straw, but it use roses in a trench. So I fill each trench up with water in order to irrigate them. You'll notice too with the quinoa, they too are planted in trenches. In Oregon, we're always planting things in raised beds to collect heat. Here, you're um, putting everything in trenches. Okay, here's something I've never grown before. So I'm pretty excited about it. Can you see these little babies here? This is sesame. And it makes black sesame seeds. I got these seeds from Strictly Medicinal Seeds. They're based in Williams, Oregon. That was a company former, um, but run by Rito Czech, formerly known as Horizon Herbs, best known for their medicinal herbs. But they also do some staple crops like that. A little further down here, in the same rows, I'm planting some, I've got some amaranth planted here. Right here, you can see. This is called marbled amaranth. And I'll tell you what you were hearing there. <laughs> so this is a thing that makes a sound every 30 seconds. It's solar powered. It makes a particular frequency that's supposed to drive off moles and other um, underground creatures because there's a big problem with that here. So this is a method that doesn't harm the creature, just says, hey, why don't you go dig your hole someplace else? But yeah, here's the amaranth that I planted. Marbled amaranth. Now, part of the issue with growing amaranth here is that, see this? This is a wild amaranth. That's pigweed right there, or some kind of pigweed. I think there might be up to a half a dozen different wild amaranths I've seen here. Here's another one that's very dark purple that maybe you can see. So those will cross in all likelihood with the amaranth that I planted here. So I'll have to do a good job of digging up or of uh, weeding out the wild amaranth as they go. And that will be a challenge. Okay, now here we've got three long rows of garbanzo beans. The one on the far right only has a few plants in it. The two on the left are much um, more dense. So this um, this is what this is what garbanzo beans looks like as a plant. It's in the bean family. It's a legume. To people who know the, that family, this foliage will look familiar for sure. Now this particular kind of chickpeas here is a black chickpea. This is also from adaptive seed. So black chickpea, this is to go with the black sesame seeds to make a black hummus. Goth hummus, right? Here's another kind of chickpeas slash garbanzos here. Now this is just from garbanzo beans that I got in the bulk bin at the co-op. So they were organic. They are intended for eating. I don't know how old they were. They came up pretty darn well though. Yep, they came up pretty darn well. The foliage looks so different here. I'll take just a teeny bit. I'll take one of these leaves off so that we can see. Look how different the leaf shape is from the one kind to the other. Far, far less um, divided. Yeah. Same species, that's just a different 
That's just how that is for some reason. So then this other row here, which is almost empty of chippies, this, this plant looks a little bit like sort of halfway between the two as for how finely divided the leaves are. This one is the chick, is the chickpea that is sold by Franchi, the Italian seed company, who I've had really good luck with with most of their stuff. So it was disappointing to see such a low germination rate with this, but their germination rate on this was like 10% something. Yeah, pretty poor. And so in the spaces in between, where it didn't do well here, here you can see I put more of the sesame just to fill in the row since there's irrigation going here anyway. <laughs> Other big crop and the East Garden here is corn. And this is the glass gem corn that you might have seen pictures of. Very, very pretty corn, heirloom variety, multicolored with, yeah, sort of glass bead sort of appearance to it. Now you can look over and you can see all the all the way down there. On the left, there's a green patch, a green row there. Those are sunflower seeds, mammoth sunflower seeds from Baker Creek. But then it's corn and the rest of them. This, these, uh, it's like three and a half long rows here making a block. And that's about 200 row feet altogether of this corn. I've got them planted about 18 inches apart and it's one to three seeds per hole. And I'm not planning on thinning them. So if two came up, I'm planning on just leaving both of them there and seeing what happens. We'll see, we'll see, what, we'll see what goes on, if, uh, if uh, they can handle that or if they'll need to be thinned down to fewer plants. But the plan for now is just to let them all go. And this was the entire packet. So this is 250 seeds and most of them came up. So it's, it was a really high germination rate. These are from Native Seed Search, which is in Tucson, Arizona. And so if you get seeds from that, that's helping to support the Native American communities there, which is also awesome. When you're saving vegetables for seed, a lot of different vegetables need to have a certain number that you're growing in order to have enough genetic diversity. With some plants it's less, with some with more. With corn they say it's at least 200. So that's why I'm psyched that all these came up like this because this is good enough that you could then um, sell the seed or share it with other people or give some back uh, knowing that you've gotten enough genetic diversity that, it, that it's worth it. Because if you have not enough genetic diversity you can start to breed yourself into a bottleneck, plants start to, um, they start to not do well after a while. Here's a common weed here. I have no idea what it is. I'm leaving it go because it's pretty. Currently watered every day with the tape irrigation that you can see here for about 30 minutes. That's the East Garden.